This is the seventh week of this, these two verses, and this is what it says. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to the Greeks. That's the part we're going to talk about today. To the Jew first, and also to the Greeks. Some of you are wondering, we're going to be talking about Jews today. <laughs> really? Yes, we really. And um, going, well, I'm not Jewish. <laughs> Most of the, if you are Jewish, and I don't know if any of you are, <laughs> right? If you, um, and you're listening to this message, or you're listening to this message either on YouTube or on our podcast, thank you for listening. Um, but if you're not Jewish, you're, well, you're a Gentile, and especially if you believe in Jesus, you're a Gentile believer in Jesus. You may be wondering, why are we talking about this? And I would like to just start by saying, first, because it's in the text. <laughs> That's the first reason, right? It's there. You know, as a preacher, I always have to choose, you know, what, what portion am I going to bring to bear? I mean, it's two verses. And we've been going through, <laughs> we've been going through this thing with a fine-tooth comb. Um, and most of us do not feel the relevance of something that is for specifically for an ethnicity that is not our own. Um, but I want to I want to challenge you. Um, it's from the Bible, and you know what the Bible is? It's from God. What that means is, do you and I are we wiser than the Bible? Do we know what is most important and what is most relevant for where we should pay attention in life? We always just go, it's what I see, what I feel, you know, like what, what's, what's relevant to my experiences. And you know what? Most of us have an understanding of our experiences that's about this big, really. And quite frankly, if we're really, really honest, we're highly self-centered. And it's, it's like it's, we're, we're in the, locked into the prison of our own, you know, little, you know, um, perspectives. And so I'm not trying to be tough here, although I'm being kind of tough. Um, I want you to open your mind. Um, and I, I, uh, I wrestled really hard on this passage, and I've been praying for weeks on this passage because I don't know if I'm really good enough to preach this. But uh, let's get into it, okay? Um, it's something really important, and these few words will open up a whole world in something that's very, very important in the Scriptures that, um, well, pretty much 99-plus percent of Gentile Christians never pay attention to and I think this is something that I think the Lord would like us to pay attention to. So let's get into it. Part one, the epic tragedy of Jewish unbelief. The epic tragedy of Jewish unbelief. If you have any uh, Jewish friends, you will know kind of what um, James Tour, that's one of the most celebrated scientists of our time. And James Tour, um, what he says in that video is absolutely true. That if you are a Jew, it doesn't matter what kind of Jew, American Jew, a Jew from North Africa, a Jew from Europe. I mean, it's just, it's just absolutely inconceivable to them that they can believe in Jesus, right? Um, but that's part one. Part two, uh, why should we care? That is, if you are a Gentile believer in Jesus, why should we care about this? And I want to address that subject, right? And then part three, I want to close by talking about the gospel in a way that's relevant to the subject, and I'm going to call it the Jewish son of God coming for his brothers. Okay? The Jewish son of God coming for his brothers. So um, I want to say something that seems almost blindingly obvious. Okay? It is so crazy obvious, but um, regularly Christians don't ever think about this which is salvation is from the Jews. It's of the Jews. Do you know this person we worship? His name is Jesus. He has an ethnicity. <laughs> um, he's not American. Uh, he's not Chinese. He's not white, right? I mean, probably even, you know, all these pictures we have of him, it's probably his skin tone is probably wrong in most of the pictures that you have seen of him. Um, he's Jewish. And so, have you ever thought about that for a second? We believe in God, and he became a human being. He's the God-man, 
That's the person we bow down to. The name Jesus, it's a Jewish name. It comes from an old Hebrew name. Actually, his name is the, it's the 20th, it's the first century version of the name Joshua. So Jesus is the Greek version of Yeshua. Yeshua is Joshua. It's, it's, totally, it's totally Jewish. Now, I want to take you to a passage. Um, I never really thought about this, okay? I, I, as a young man, you know, like, I, I was like, okay, I, I, I thought like, okay, well, you know, my, my family's a Christian and I know Koreans are Christian. Came to America and oh, I know white people are Christian, I know black people are Christian. And so I kind of already had this theoretical idea that it's bigger than us, right? And I never thought about Jews. I, I didn't even, you know, um, I didn't know the difference. I thought they're just white people, <laughs> right? And then, uh, like, oh, you're Jewish? Well, does that make a difference? I, I, I didn't know, right? Um, in the early years of my, um, my PhD work, so I'm, I'm an ordained pastor, never really thought about this issue. And I'm working on my PhD, and I took a class called Theology of Romans, and um, you, t- you know, in this class, you got all these nerdy guys, you know, we're in PhD program, and each of us are, are going to write a paper and, and we're going to talk about some difficult passage in Romans. We're in Romans here. It's one of the most important things ever written, ever, right? And so I picked a especially thorny and difficult set of verses. It's out of Romans chapter 11, verse 24 and 25, because I was like, what does that mean? I don't think anybody knows. It's a really, really difficult passage. And I just thought it would be an interesting academic exercise, Right? And so I wrote this paper. I studied hard for it, wrote this paper. You know what it did? I've written a lot of papers. And I've studied for a lot of papers. You know how many of them I remember? Not too many. <laughs> this paper did a number on me. After studying, so there's this portion. Romans chapter 1 through 8. It's absolutely historically changing. It's probably the most dense place where the gospel is explicated in the Bible. But you get to chapter 9 through 11, and then the discussion shifts to the question, what about Israel? What about Israel? What about the Jews? And when I wrote this paper, I came away, after concluding this thing, I I just got this spiritual, like like the Holy Spirit punched me in the head saying, "You, you don't know what God is trying to do here in the world. There's something mysterious that's happening that's an interplay between Jews and Gentiles. And, um, and, there's, and I came away with this conclusion, and I want to say it to you right now. I think that all Gentile believers in Jesus, we owe a great, profound debt of love and gratitude to all Jews, regardless of whether they're saved or not saved, okay? This is what I came away with after writing this paper. If you are a Gentile believer of Jesus... I believe that we owe a deep and profound debt of gratitude and love for every single Jew out there. (laughs) And so if you go through Romans 9 through 11, I don't see how you can come away and not come to that conclusion. (laughs) It's just, it's so powerfully there. That's the tone of it. And then if you actually know something about the history of church history, of Christian history for 2,000 years, do you know how Gentile Christians have treated Jews? Again and again and again, all around the world, horribly. (laughs) Horribly. There it is, right there in the Bible. (laughs) The holy, inspired, infallible word of God. Salvation is of the Jews. And how have they been treated? by all these Gentile people that believe in their Messiah. Horribly. So, it is a part, is a huge piece of the reason why so many Jews today, because of that, it's that history, it's there, it's on them all the time. We Americans think you can just get rid of history, but it's there. If you're Jewish, you just know that, that uh, persecution and hatred and irrational prejudice by the people around you is just around the corner. And especially, and this is really crazy, by the people who call themselves Christians. Again and again, the people who call themselves Christians have been the ones to murder them, abandon them, blame them, and hate them. So if you're listening to this message and you're Jewish, 
I want to just start this way. Please forgive us. In the name of the church, of all these Gentile believers, I just want to say, please, we beg your forgiveness. Right? For our absurd, complete, insensitive, irrational prejudice and hatred, please forgive us. We apologize. Right? Now let me take you into a portion of Romans chapter 9, verse 1. So I'm going to have this um, up there for you so you can follow. It's a bit of a lengthy passage to follow. So this is how this discussion on the question of what about Israel starts. So this is Apostle Paul. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit. Now catch these words. That I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. Did you catch that? You know what he just said? If I could be cut off from Christ and go to hell, and all of them who are Jews could be saved, I would take that trade. That's what he just said. Can you believe that's in the Bible? That one of the apostles would say, I would trade my eternal salvation for all of the salvation of all my fellow Jews. That's what he just said. Verse four, they are Israelites and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, that's the Messiah, who is God over all, blessed forever, amen. Then he goes on to say, but it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. Did you catch that? <laughs> That's a, it's a strange phrase. For not all who are descended from Israel, you know who that is, that's Jews, right? Belong to Israel. You know what he just said? Gentiles can belong to Israel. <laughs> Let me just stop for a moment and just say this. If you believe in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Christ. Christ is just Greek for Messiah, right? And you, there's no salvation from that belief unless you have that belief. You know you belong to, let me just say it, the church, yes. You belong to Israel. <laughs> you know how weird that sounds to a, Jewish, to a Jewish person? You and I, if you believe in Jesus, we belong to Israel. But many who are Jewish, they don't. <laughs> That's what he just said. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. But through Isaac shall your offspring be named. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God. Let me say that again. It is not the children according to the blood. Not just because you are Jewish. It is not of the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of promise are counted as offspring. Now, if you grew up inside the church, this thing is just taught just so regularly, we just tend to kind of forget the Jewishness of it. So let me give you an example of this. If you didn't grow up in the church, you might not know this song. <laughs> but if you grew up in this church, I mean, this is something we teach like three-year-olds, okay? <laughs> so this is a song you learn when you're really little, and I bet you a number of you who grew up in the church know this song. It goes like this. Father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. And listen to the next verse. And I am one of them. Korean kid, Chinese kid, white kid, German kid, Australian kid, Vietnamese kid. You are one of them and so are you. So let's go praise the Lord. <laughs> Did you guys catch that? We teach the song. <laughs> you know, all these Gentile kids sitting there. And they're saying, Father Abraham and many sons. I'm one of them. I'm his son. <laughs> because of this verse. And many other verses like it. He's first their God. God chose them first. Abraham is literally their father. <laughs> he's not your father. Most of you in this room, he's not your father. <laughs> he's your spiritual father. 
He's my spiritual father. But he is actually, he is their father. <laughs> but they don't know the Messiah. They don't know the most important son of Abraham who will complete Israel. That's the tragedy, the epic tragedy of Jewish unbelief. Now, let me just say a few other things about this. Um, you know, because they've been treated so horribly, there's this, this, like, they have, like, they seem to have, like, two categories in their mind, right? There's Jewish and everything that means being Jewish, and then there's Christian, and Christian, absolutely, you cannot be in that category if you're a Jew. That's what they believe. I've yet to meet the Jew who doesn't believe that until they believe in Jesus. <laughs> and it takes darn near a crazy miracle for them to believe in Jesus. Anytime you meet a Jewish person who came to be a follower of Yeshua, as they call him, because if they say I follow Jesus, then everybody around them goes completely nuts. <laughs> all their friends, all their family, they go completely nuts. Jesus, Jesus is like a swear word. So, um, part of it is because of the history. And it's a horrific history. So let me just now urge one little piece of application to you. You have a friend. You probably think he's just white. <laughs> okay? And then you find out, oh, you're Jewish. And then if he finds out you're a Christian, you know what you should say? We're sorry. Please say it. Say it. It'll probably be shocking. What? You're sorry? For what? Because we Christians have done you wrong. And we owe you, right? It's the first thing I want to ask you to consider that, right? Other reasons why they don't um, believe. Now, it, it's taught in the Bible, and some people think it's just a prejudice in the Bible, but if you talk to Jews <laughs> and their description of what it's like, it's not a prejudice. It's absolutely a fact on the ground. Most Jews seem to approach religion or God in two basic buckets. First, they believe in the law, <laughs> So most Jews believe that their faith is built on what they call the Torah. The Torah is the first five books of the Bible. It's the first five books of what they call the Bible. And they call their Bible, we call it the Old Testament, they call it Tanakh, right? And Tanakh stands for, the T stands for Torah, N stands for Nebiim, which is the prophets, and K is Ketubim. So it's kind of, Tanakh basically means all of the law of Moses, the prophets and the special writings. And when you put it all together, it's, we call it the Old Testament, right? And um, so some of them, and this is, a little, this is crazy. It took me a while before I learned this. Most have never read it. <laughs> They've never read it. I'll say another one. Um, you know, have you ever met like, a lot of Catholics? They've never read the Bible. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're Catholic and I don't mean to be like insulting, but it's just a kind of a fact on the ground, right? Jews have never read most of them, most of them. They've never touched it. It's their holy book. They've never touched it. You know how they learned from it? They learned from the rabbis. And there's all kinds of, there's like thousands of pages of commentary. And almost all that commentary is only on the first five books. The law of Moses, the Torah. They, like they never get around to Proverbs, Song of Solomon. Just a few, very, very few of them get around to Isaiah or all these other books. Now, of course, you know, most a lot of Protestant Christians, we don't read the Bible very well either, and that's to our shame. But, um, but that, that's a big part of it. So, but as they hear, they learn from the law through the rabbis, and so them, for them to be Jewish religiously is to follow the rules. They don't know anything besides, largely besides legalism. And sometimes they hear about covenant, and they can hear sense of the law, love of God through covenant, but largely, it's the law. So that's one, one, one way they tend to go and why they don't believe. And then a lot of them, just like many of you, you grew up in the church, and if all you ever got was law and not gospel, you probably ran away from God, right? Well, they do too. So the second reaction that so many Jews have is to basically reject religion. And so that's most of the Jews in America from, from, that I've met. Most of them are secular. And so they don't even believe in God, but they absolutely cling to being Jewish. So this is the part that's crazy. Most Jews um, think that uh, you can believe in anything and stay Jewish, but you can't believe in Jesus. 
You can believe in anything. I mean, like, you can be atheist. <laughs> you can be communist. You can believe in some radical ideology. But if you believe in Jesus, somehow that is being a traitor to being a Jew and you can't be Jewish if you believe in a Jewish Messiah. They believe that. It's utterly false. It's completely, it's like there's no foundation to it whatsoever. It's absolutely false. And yet, it's completely commonplace. And when I think back on this thing, I just think this has got to be one of the most demonic lies out there in the world. And so if you're a Gentile Christian and you have any Jewish friends, I want you to think about this. Think about this horrible lie that the vast majority of Jews are under. And if you have a Jewish friend or um, co-worker, they probably believe in that too. Let's go to part two. Why should we care? Why should we care? So I'm going to give you some reasons. The first one is, um, it's simple, because God cares. <laughs> because God desperately longs for the children of Abraham to know Jesus, right? So let's go to Romans chapter 9, verse 30. I'll just let you hear from the Bible. Right? Not from me, because you see it from the Bible. So, follow please. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it? That is, a righteousness that is by faith. I hope you guys get that by now. We've been preaching it for weeks. A righteousness from God by faith. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness did not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. What are we talking about? By faith in Jesus. By faith in the Messiah. By faith in the great work that the Messiah has done for us. And then thus by grace through faith, we receive salvation through him. But they have done it instead as if it were based on works. They have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. This is a quote from Isaiah chapter 28. So Paul goes on, Brothers, and I've highlighted this for you, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. They have to come to that conclusion. The Torah is not good enough for righteousness. They must come to the end of the law for righteousness and must come to the Messiah. Now, I want to just point out this thing. I said that God cares. Where does it say in this passage that God cares? It says here, Paul says, my heart's desire and prayer to God for them is that they may be saved. I also read you that portion in in chapter 9, where Paul basically says, I mean, like, just horrendous anguish that they would be saved. And you're like, well, that's that's what Paul said. Yeah, that is what he said. Let me tell you something. When Paul said it, that's God saying it. It's the Bible. If Paul wrote it, you know who's saying it? It's a lot more important than Paul saying it. God is saying it. God is saying it. Would we hear our Father today? Hear our Father. He is saying it. He cares desperately that they would know his Son. Right? Reason number one. Let's go to reason number two. So I'm going to call this reason, there is a promise in Romans 11, and it's a, it's a mysterious promise that something glorious will come about if the Gentiles go back and reach the Jews. It's really interesting. It's mysterious. And let me, so let's get to it. Romans chapter 11, and so let's have that projected. Romans 11, this is how it goes. So I ask... Did they stumble in order that they might fall? 
By no means. Rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. That's you and me. Has come to the nations. So as to make Israel jealous. This is really interesting. It's like all these other people, (laughs) the French, the Australians, the Filipinos, they will say, Father Abraham had many sons. And God wants Jews to say, what are you talking about? That's my heritage. He wants them to be jealous. Now here's the next part. Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Something more is going to come about if the Jews will come back to Jesus, right? Let me go on. Now I am speaking to you Gentiles, inasmuch then as I am an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my ministry in order somehow to make my fellow Jews jealous and thus save some of them. For if in their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? That's what he's saying. See, the Jews rejected Jesus. And then God offered salvation to everybody else. But then he's saying, but then what if they come back to Jesus? What, something even more incredible and more glorious could come about? I'll tell you a, a funny story. Um, last weekend, my wife and I went to an evangelism conference <laughs> down here in Cupertino. Of a valley church. It was being led by these Israeli guys. It's a ministry called Tree of Life. It's coming out of like Tel Aviv, Israel. When these guys talk, you can tell they're from, like one of the guys you can tell he's from Israel. The other guy sounded American, but he was Jewish, okay? And, um, and these Chinese folks, I kid you not, at lunchtime, these Chinese folks sat down and then they bowed their head to pray. And you know what they started doing? They started singing this Hebrew song. And, and I, got really emotional. And then after they lifted their head from the prayer, I said, where did you learn that? And they said, we have a special love for Jews. And so we learned this song to always remind ourselves to sing this, their prayer, which is our prayer of thanksgiving to God. Wow. So, There are certain people, just a few, apparently a few special Chinese people anyway, at least in our city, they get this. They want this glorious thing. Something is is out there for the people of God and the kingdom of God. If the Gentiles will reach the Jews. Let me give you three practical reasons. I give you two huge spiritual reasons. And now let me give you some Three practical reasons why we should care. Okay? So the first one. The first one is, I'll bet you you all have a Jewish friend. (laughs) They live everywhere. Especially in the major cities. Some of you have a Jewish friend. You don't even know he's Jewish. You just think he's white. Or she's white. And so, you don't know that they have a special set of, like, obstacles to meet the king of kings and the lord of lords their king and so let me just uh, share with you did you let me give you some names and um you know if you meet a, a person and their last name is kim gee i wonder what country they're from <laughs> you meet a chang i wonder what country they're from you meet a wen right you're like oh they're vietnamese right i mean you, you just know like and, and, and it helps you just know a little something about them and because you can just know a little something, you meet a Patel, okay? You just know a little something about them, and it just helps you to love them a little better. But, you know, I had no idea who's Jewish. <laughs> I just thought they were all white. And I bet you're special. A lot, you know, the majority of the people in this room have some kind of Asian background. You probably think they're a little white. That's crazy ignorant, quite frankly. And I'm not trying to be mean to you. 
because that, that was, that's, I was just same in the bucket. But as I grew up older, bit by bit, I just started learning a few things. So let me just give you a few names. These are Jewish names, okay? Um, and you probably know somebody with one of these names. Abram's, <laughs> Abram's son, which basically means the son of Abraham. Gee, I wonder if he's Jewish. His last name literally means son of Abraham, <laughs> right? Birnbaum, Brownstein, all the Steins are Steins. Something Stein, something Stein. They're Jewish, okay? Um, Cohen, you know where Cohen comes from? It comes from Hebrew word for priest. All the Cohens are they're Jewish. All the Golds, Gold, Goldman, Goldschmidt, Goldwater. You know why? Because historically the Christians had a prejudice that somehow money was a dirty thing. So there's this crazy idea today that Jews just love money, so they go after money. You ever heard this thing? Oh my goodness, please don't believe it, All right? I don't know, everybody loves money. Do the Jews especially love money? That seems like a stupid idea to me. That just seems like an, an ugly prejudice. But you know why? Historically, they're very good at money. Why? Because the Christians didn't want to touch it. So then the Jews had to like, find their place. They have been very, very good historical middlemen. And so you've heard of Goldman Sachs. <laughs> you've heard of Salomon Brothers. Salomon, Jewish name. Because historically, the Christians, it's the Christians' fault. <laughs> why are they good at it? Oh, and by the way, the silvers, they're, they're Jewish. Gold and silver. Okay, so silver, Silverstein, Silverman, Silber, and then G, uh, the Z, Zilber, Zilberman. They're Jewish. Okay, a few more. Friedman, Harsh, Hoffman, Kaplan, Klein, Kleinman, Kleinman, Leibowitz, Liebel, uh, Le- Lefkowitz, Levinson, Levi, Moskowitz, Nussbaum, Pearlstein, Rappaport, Rosenberg. You know any Rosenbergs? I know three Rosenbergs. <laughs> Rubin, one of my closest friends in college, she's a Rubin. Rubinstein, Roth, Rothman, Rothschild, Rothstein, Weinstein, Weinstein. <laughs> Weinberger, Weitz, Weitzman, and so many more. They're all Jewish. That's the first practical. You know somebody's Jewish. They're probably sitting in the next cubicle, okay? Second reason. Jews have a deep respect. You know, their whole culture has been built on word. Their whole culture is built on literacy and studying. You want to know why they're smart? Because <laughs> this is at the top of their values. So it's, like, it's, it's amazing. When you put word and studying at the top of your values, guess what that tends to happen? they tend to become smart. They tend to do really well in school. They tend to rise wherever they go in society and they start coming into influential places in society. Now just think about it. There's a set of people, very talented, for thousands of years. I mean, they can't even help but care about studying. They're just gonna care about studying. It's sort of like, you know, like some other people you think about, like East Asians, you know? Thousands of years of caring about studying. So you think you're going to have kids and they're not going to care about studying? Of course they're going to care about studying. (laughs) Well, Jews are like that. And then they arise into society and then they arise into prominence and then they shape the culture. Now just have a set of people that shape the culture and they all think Christianity is bad and evil and hates them. And Jesus is a swear word that is not good for the culture. (laughs) That is not good for the culture. You want to help our neighbors? A good way to help all the other neighbors, our African-American neighbors, our Hispanic neighbors, all our, you know, all our neighbors, our Asian neighbors, you name it, help the Jews. Let me give you one more reason, one more practical reason. Um, it is a very common thing that people think that if I believe in Jesus, I'm being a traitor to my people. That's what they think. It's just a really common belief. So Jews have this belief, but they're not, only Jew, not only Jews have this belief. And some of you know this. If you come from a culture that Christianity has not made much headway in, it's a very, very unreached culture. They all think that it's the white man's God. It's a Korean, I mean, literally, they think it's a Korean God. I'm like, that's crazy. <laughs> 
I'm like, that's funny, right? But because Christianity's made enough headway in, inside of, 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 of Korean culture, some people think it's some kind of a Korean thing. But how many Indians do you think it's they think you can believe in Jesus and stay Indian? Many of them don't believe that. Now, they kind of know, like, if you're from Kerala, a lot of Kerala folks, well, they're Christians. But if you're Punjabi, not so much. Okay? So if you would learn to love one set of people that had this profound, profound lie in their mind, because Jesus, isn't Jesus your God? And is not Jesus the God of your people? Is Jesus the redeemer of just people? Isn't he not the redeemer of China? Is he not the redeemer of the one that completes being Korean? Not just Koreans, but he's the one that can help sanctify Korean culture. He can sanctify Mexican culture. He can sanctify American culture. We want a better kind of America. We want a more healed America. Who's going to heal America as Americans? Jesus. Isn't that true? And every people needs the Redeemer, not just for them as an individual, but for their people. Right? For their people. And if we could begin to really love and serve one set of people where that prejudice is super intense, it will help us to love and unfurl and push back against the stumbling blocks and unbelief of other people who have a similar kind of way of stumbling. Does that make sense? All right, let's close. I want to tell you about the Jewish son of God coming for his, his brothers. There's a really famous passage in the Bible. It's Luke chapter 15. And um, many of you know it as uh, the parable of the prodigal son. You've heard this, you've heard this story? So for some of you who haven't heard the story, here's how the story goes. There's a father. Jesus tells the story. There's a father. He has two sons. One day the younger son goes, Father, can I have my inheritance now? Because I don't want to be in this house anymore. That's the equivalent of saying, I wish you were dead so that I can just have your money. Because <laughs> I just want to be apart from you and have my own life, just your money. So the According to Jesus, the father says yes. Hands the younger son his inheritance. The son takes off. He lives immorally, wildly, until he destroys his life. And finally gets to a point where this is the way Jesus tells the story. He is looking at the things that the pigs eat and he wants to eat them. And for a Jewish audience, let me tell you, that's a pretty good way of saying the bottom, bottom, rock bottom. <laughs> okay? That's pretty much what she's saying. This guy got to rock bottom. And then he says, but in my father's house, there's much to eat. And I'll go back, ask to be a servant, and I hope he'll forgive me and take me back. So the younger son goes home, and before he's even gotten there, the father runs out to him. Does not curse him out does not punch him in the head. Instead, throws a whole party. And then, but that's not the end of the story. The old, there's an older brother who never cursed out his father, never told him, I wish you were dead. All you are is just money to me. Instead, he kept the rules. He kept the rules. And he stayed faithful, so to speak, to dad. And when the younger son comes home, he's livid. <laughs> there was no party for me. And then the father just says to the older son, can't you see your brother was dead, but now he's alive. Can't you come to the dinner? And that's how the story ends. And what I want to share with you is, what does this have to do with Jews? I want to give you St. Augustine, Augustine, one of the greatest Bible readers of all time, his understanding of this story. You know what he said? He said, most of us, when we read this story, we only think of, well, there's irreligious, the younger brother is irreligious and he ran away from home and he loved money until he wrecked his life. It was immoral and God forgave him through Jesus. But then there's the religious older brother and he's just judgmental. 
to the immoral younger brother. And that's how I hope many of you heard the story. And you know what? It's a superb and sound understanding of the story. But then Augustine, I mean, this guy's so, gosh, this is why he's Augustine, okay? He just takes it to a whole nother level. He said, the younger brother are all the Gentiles. They never cared about the promises. They don't care about what's in the father's house. They don't care about Abraham, Moses, the prophets, David, all the riches that God promises. That's the Gentiles. You know all they care about? They just want money and pleasure. And then they worship and bow down to all the gods of money and pleasure. But when the Gentiles want to eat what the pigs eat, rock bottom, some of them find out there is a Jesus sent by the Father to come bring them home. You know, what's missing inside the story is this. There's a younger brother, and then what Augustine says is the older brother, the older brother of the Jews. And so inside the story, there are no good sons. There's only, there's only a bad son because he wants to go, you know, wreck his life through uh, uh, hedonism and pleasure. And then there's the so-called good son who's really not a good son. He's the self-righteous son, the legalistic son. And Augustine said, that's the Jews. And you know what the story is screaming for? A better son. That's what the story is screaming for, a better son. And you know what the good news is? There is a better son. The real true son of the father. He was better than the younger son. And he was better than the older son. He was the true oldest brother. And he came to lay down his life to take home both the younger son and the older son and sit at that dinner table and party together. Now, here's the way I want to close this message. That's the gospel. At one point or another, all of you who believe in Jesus, you probably got to the rock bottom place where you're like, gosh, I want to eat the pig's food. This is bad. But there's a better way through the son, Jesus and he came to make me his brother so I can be his sister. I could be a child of God through Jesus and be accepted at the table. And you answered that call. And here's the way Augustine wraps this up. So the younger sons come home at the table, of, at the table feast of God. All these younger sons are there, right? And Jesus is there. Who's not there? the older sons, the older brothers, the Jews, they're very often, they're not there at the table. We're going to go to the table of the Lord today. God wants them to be at the table with us. They're our brothers and our sisters. You know, if you ever went to Thanksgiving dinner and your sister wasn't there, when you feel it, it's like a big old hole at that table, Right? She's not there, her husband's not there, her kids aren't there. Wouldn't it hurt? It hurts Jesus. And I'm asking you today, when we go to the table, Jesus came for them too, just like he came for us. Let's pray. Lord, um, going to go to your table and um, as we take this most holy food we thank you that when we ran away or when we were self-righteous we were Gentile Pharisees we were Gentile prodigal sons you came to come get us we pray now that you would go and chase down our Jewish brothers and sisters, the Jewish Pharisees, and the irreligious Jewish secular prodigals. And would you send us to be like Jesus and help them meet their Messiah, the Messiah, our Messiah, you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray.